visiting us. Actually, this is his last week of uh, visit. Uh, very nice to have you here. So Francesco, he did his uh, PhD at uh, MIT, and then postdoc at Berkeley, and the second postdoc, he like, liked California, I suppose. So he stayed in California for the second postdoc at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And now he's a professor at the University Daily Studi in Padua. And he's an expert in uh, dark matter. And he's going to talk about uh, new theory tools to unveil the mystery of dark matter. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the hospitality. I had, I had three fantastic weeks here. And uh, it's really nice to conclude my visit with the uh, colloquium, yes. where I will tell you about uh, some uh, work I've been doing on uh, developing new theory tools to study dark matter. Of course, since this is a colloquium, it will not be a technical talk. And before I get to the tools, I would like to provide some perspective and to, to, to tell you what the big questions are, what the big questions are that we are trying to answer. Okay? So the big question is apparently very simple and uh, it is all about understanding our universe, in particular understanding what the building blocks are of the universe and uh, we cannot be happy just with the list of fundamental particles in the modern language. We also want to understand the principle, the principles that govern the interactions among these building blocks. Okay, so that's what I do for a living. That's what most people in this room do for a living. Many people in the world do this for a living. And we are not the first ones to raise this question. We have evidence that at least uh, at least as uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the ancient Greek, Greek philosophers, you, I'm sure you've heard about Democritus for the first uh, time uh, speaking about atoms 400 years before Christ. So this is a question that has been around for more than 2,000 years. And uh, not only Democritus, also other people uh, suggested different answers. Democritus called these uh, atoms. Somebody else was saying that everything was made of water. Somebody else was saying fire. All sorts of crazy answers. And uh, the problem with uh, the approach of uh, the ancient times is that nobody could care less about finding an experimental validation of their theory. Okay? So without the experimental check, it was really impossible to establish who was right and who was wrong. Okay? So things were steady for centuries, actually for uh, thousands of years again. And uh, the big change in the game was uh, due to Galileo Galilei, so a few thousand years after Democritus. We introduced the scientific method, which is basically the way we do research today. Okay? Putting emphasis on two crucial aspects. The first one is the mathematical language to describe nature. That's what we do now. It's normal, but it was far from being trivial back in the days. As well as the importance, the importance of the experimental validation. It's good to come up with very clever theories. It's even more important to know that you're right. Okay? So theory and experiment, they have to go together. Now, we are here in the, the 16th, 17th centuries, century uh, after Christ, and uh, we need to wait two more centuries to finally find the experimental validation of atoms. Okay? This was in uh, roughly 200 years ago, due to Dalton. For the first time, the atoms the Mobitus was uh, speaking about, we knew they were real, we knew they existed. And uh, the last century was really the golden age for uh, atomic and subatomic physics. We learned that in spite of their name, atoms in the ancient Greek meant something you cannot split, okay? something that cannot be divided. We know now, of course, that the atoms have a structure. There are uh, nuclei, there are electrons spinning around, the nuclei are made of protons and neutrons, and so on. So now we came to a very compelling and uh, unified description of the fundamental blocks of our universe known as the standard model. Sorry, so, that, that thing was Dalton, really? Yeah, so that's what I found uh, online. Uh, so I... I, I, <laughs> I see balls in there. <laughs> Where? <laughs> 16. 16 is the balls. I don't think you meant the balls. <laughs> I don't think... 
Maybe, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, I, 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 I'm no wonder for saying sure, so that's what I found out. Oh, this, this is the classification of all the atoms, yes. And that's, I guess, the names he gave. Pretty much. And then it's number, okay, that's okay. so as I, as I was saying now, the last century was really crucial in exploring the subnuclear, the subatomic and subnuclear world. <laughs> And now we have a fantastic unified descriptions of the building blocks of the visible universe. And I will emphasize visible a lot during my talk. So before I move on, do you know who this guy is? Of course I did. Do you know? Who knows who this guy is? You don't nobody knows? But no. <laughs> Sorry? Too far away. Oh, I could recognize even for two kilometers. <laughs> okay, so, so, there will be a surprise. Great. Let me explain the figure first. Let me explain the figure first because this is a serious slide. Okay. So, on the horizontal axis, there are the length scale in nature expressed in meters. Okay? So, there are nuclei, nuclei, you see, made of protons, neutrons, atoms, molecules, planets, the solar system, galaxies, the uh, cluster of galaxies. So I made this figure, I produced this figure when I was uh, giving this sort of talks for the first time a few years ago. And when it was about to choose what to put at the meter scale, I put my hero as a kid. So this is uh, Marco Van Basten. Okay. Who? Marco Van Basten. Van Basten. Never heard of him. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's embarrassing. Okay. <laughs> so I was born in the 80s. I'm an AC Milan fan. It's not so good now. But uh, they, this was the most amazing manifestation of objects on the meter scale for me. Now, <laughs> I will make an exception today. Okay, I will make an exception today. Today, I will use this figure. So now, do I need to explain this? No, I don't. You, you know, right? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay, so the point of this slide is to show you that everything from nuclei all the way to cluster of galaxies, now we know, thanks to the work done the previous century, and also, of course, in the, last, uh, in the last years of this century. But everything started 50, 60 years ago. We know that the visible universe, from atoms to galaxies, is made of the same building blocks. Okay? And these building blocks are the fundamental particles of the standard model. So here is a suggestive figure to visualize these fundamental building blocks that we know now. We know what they are. So let's go through the list. Uh, we have quarks. Quarks are the constituents of protons and neutrons, the lightest one, then there are also heavier brothers of quarks, but they feel the strong force. Then there are leptons. Leptons are particles like the electrons. The electrons are the particles spinning around the atoms. There are heavier versions of the electrons, new, new, known as the muon and the tau. And then there are neutrinos, which are also leptons, and they do not feel the strong force. Now, the fundamental forces, weak, strong, and electromagnetic, are mediated by the exchange of these force carriers, force mediators, which are photons, gluons, W, and Z. And finally, we know that it's not possible to give a mass to these fundamental particles in a consistent way. And we know now that the mechanism responsible for the mass is the Higgs boson that was discovered only seven years ago. Okay? So think about Democritus. Democritus lived many years ago, okay? more than 2,000 years ago. And uh, we are, in some sense, uh, I think, uh, quite lucky because we are living during the phase where we are getting quantitative answers to these fundamental questions. Okay? So this is 2012. Everybody was born in this room, I'm sure, in 2012. So I remember, I watched the announcement live. When they... sir. Oh, even better. I was at home. But I, couldn't, I couldn't get in. In the auditorium. I'm sure it was tough to make it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so it was the 4th of July 2012. We all remember the day very well. So it was, uh, it was really, really exciting. And uh, now the standard model is complete. Wait, wait. Would you say that the Higgs boson is also a force mediator? Well, it depends what you really mean. Of course, uh, there are processes where you can exchange and it. So here I mean. Uh, by force, I mean uh, gauge symmetry, yeah. so the language of the standard model. But of course, the Higgs can, uh, and we will see in the direct detection later that actually the Higgs can be responsible. So I will, I will make a comment. And I thank you for, for bringing this, uh, this, uh, this point. But uh, for 
conventionally for, by forces and mean gauge symmetries of the standard model. Okay, so as I said, we do not want a list only. We have the list in the previous slide. We also want to understand the principles. We also want to understand interactions. We want to understand how fundamental interactions work. And this beautiful theory, the standard model, not only gives us a list of particles, but it also gives us a theoretical framework to compute probabilities for any type of processes among these interactions. And the theory is so elegant that the fundamental laws can be written on a t-shirt or on a coffee mug. If you go around institutes in the world, you find these at gift shops. So you see that we also have not only a list of particles, but we also have a beautiful theory, very elegant, with very compact equations that of course, if you know quantum field theory, you can use this, uh, this uh, equation to compute any kind of probability. And this theory was very successful, the standard model, in the last 40 years. All the data taken at particle colliders and accelerators were consistently described by this theory. Okay? So, can we declare wi victory? Like, uh, I, I, I say that our goal was to understand how the visible world works, what are the blocks, what are the principles. We seem to get an answer here, okay? Well, the answer is no, otherwise this would be a very short talk, okay? So the answer is no, and that's what my talk will be about. It will be about this no, and I want to explain why no is no. And uh, here I put a list of uh, some of the standard model drawbacks, okay? I'm sure I didn't include all of them. These are probably the most famous ones. I just want to show that there is more than one reason to believe that the standard model is not the ultimate theory of nature. And uh, today I want to focus on uh, the problem that we face once we measure the energy budget of the universe. Okay? So in this pie chart diagram, I put three different components contributing to the energy density of the universe today. Okay? And if you see, the standard model matter or visible matter, if you want, the one we can see with our eyes. It's only 5%, actually it's much less because some of them is dark, it doesn't emit radiation, but we know now with very high precision that only 5% of the energy in the universe is made of stuff we know about. The quark, leptons, and all of that stuff. It's only 5%. The remaining 95% is of unknown origin and composition. Yes? Yes, yes, between 0 0.5 and 1, yes. The other is that there are so-called dark baryons. So they are made of standard model stuff, but we cannot see, they don't, they don't emit light. OK, and so there is an important difference to be made in this 95%. 25% is the so-called dark matter. 70% is dark energy. Dark matter is a new form of matter which, in some sense, is similar to the one we are already familiar with, in the sense that uh, he interacts with us through gravity, and uh, it's, it could be just another particle, okay? Like the neutron, like the proton, but we know electric charge and very different properties. Dark energy is a very different beast because it behaves like nothing we know about. It has negative pressure, meaning that it's responsible for the current acceleration of the universe because it's completely dominating the budget, so the universe is accelerating now. And uh, for this talk, I will focus on this 25%, not because this is not interesting, just because this is the one I'm more expert on, and also because it's the one that looks uh, more similar to this 5%, so maybe there is uh, some hope to find a connection between them. So if we focus on this part of the diagram, you see that in terms of the regular matter, what we call matter, 5% is there, 25% is there. So the matter is five times more abundant than what we already know about. So it's most of the matter in the universe, and we don't know what it is. Okay? So the first question, at least that's the first question I asked myself when I heard about dark matter. How do we know that it exists? So if something is invisible, how do we know that something visible is there? If I cannot look at that, I don't know it exists. So there is a very clever way to do that. And all we need to do is to study very carefully the motion of visible objects. Okay? Because this dark matter interacts with uh, the visible universe through gravity. So if we study the motion of the visible objects very carefully, we can reconstruct the reason why they're moving, and in particular, 
what bodies are putting some gravitational forces on them. We will see one example which is really nice and really clear, I think. Just to put everything into some historical perspective, it's almost 100 years now, it's almost 100 years that uh, the dark matter was uh, pointed out for the first time by the Swiss astronomer Fritz Wicke, who studied the motion of the galaxies in the coma cluster and uh, he found something that was not uh, right. Okay? So this was way too early because the observations were not uh, as precise and as reliable as they are now. And uh, also I believe that people were not ready to accept something so drastic. So Dark Matter was taken seriously in the 70s thanks to the work uh, led by Vera Rubin who studied the galactic rotation. So what did she do? So here is a beautiful picture of a galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy very similar to the Milky Way, the galaxy where we live. This cannot be the Milky Way, of course, because to take a picture of the Milky Way, we have to be outside of the Milky Way, but we are in the Milky Way. So this is not the Milky Way, but it's very similar to the Milky Way. And what you see in this photo is only the visible matter, of course. You don't see. If there is something invisible, you do not see that. So you see that most of the matter is focused, is uh, concentrated in the center. So if you move to other regions, the density of visible matter is smaller. OK, so that's an important point. So Vera Rubin did the following. She studied the motion of the objects in the outskirts of the galaxy. So objects far away, stars, far away from the galaxy, from the center of the galaxy. And uh, she studied how fast they were moving as a function of the distance from the center. So imagine this plot, which I will show you in a second. Horizontal axis, distance from the center. Vertical axis, velocity. The expectation was that objects far away from the center were moving slower. Why? Because if you are far away from the center, you are far away from most of the mass. So most of the mass is here. So these objects were feeling less gravity. You know, the Newton law, the force goes like the square, inverse square distance. So objects far away were feeling less gravity, and so they were expected to move slower. Now, what she found was a big surprise, because here is not official data, of course, but this is a sketch of what uh, the expectation was, this decrease with the distance, and what actually was observed. So objects moving, objects, sorry, moving, yes, uh, away from the center, had a velocity which did not depend on the distance. So she was looking at objects more and far away, more and far away from the center, the velocity was not changing. And this was surprising because it was not consistent with the idea that this motion was uh, uh, generated by the gravitational force of the objects here. Okay? Most of the mass was concentrated here. So the modern view now is that this is now that galaxy, only this tiny blue disk. So the galaxy is uh, embedded within a spherical halo of dark matter, which is something that is there, we don't know what it's made of, we don't know the mass of its fundamental constituents. We know it's there and it's providing the additional gravitational force to explain how this behavior is possible. Okay? So that's the interpretation of the experimental data by Vera Rubin. Okay? Now we are in the 70s and uh, we had collection of data over 40 years now of uh, galactic rotation curves. And we have now many other evidences of dark matter. So not only at the scale of a galaxy, but also at the scale of cluster of galaxies, and all the way to scales of the entire universe. Okay? So now we know that dark matter exists. Okay? There is an evidence that cannot be denied on multiple scales. But these observations, they only tell us that there is something visible there, they don't tell us what it is. They don't tell us the mass, the properties, the spin, all of these fundamental properties. So understanding this composition is one of the most urgent open questions in fundamental physics, because this is five times more abundant than regular matter. Now we know this number very precisely. So I bring the point of view of a theorist, of course, because that's who I am. And uh, roughly speaking, this is the situation. So you have the standard model with the beautiful particles and the beautiful laws, and then you have some black box here that you have no idea what it is. You only know it's there, and you know that it talks between, it talks with the standard model through gravitational interactions. Of course, 
this could be only one way the two sectors are in communication and if there is any other way and that depends on the model you suggest when you write down the model then you end up having other interactions then if there is something else here this could be a way that we use to test a specific theory okay so the goal of people like me and uh, many other people around the world is to come up with a new t-shirt where we print not only the standard model but also the constituents of dark matter and the interaction with dark matter. So that would be a t-shirt that explains at least not the entire energy of the universe, only 30%, but at least the entire amount of matter in the universe. And what uh, eventually ends up being on this t-shirt cannot be anything we want, cannot be arbitrary, because there are uh, solid bounds on the mass and on the companies, because we have been searching for dark matter over, for over 30 years. Okay, so. We know, we don't know what it is, but we already know that it cannot be something, okay? We, the, we, we had searches and they produced exclusion leads. So here is a plot that I also made when I was trying to come up with a summary of uh, the landscape of theoretical models. And this plot ended up generating confusion, which is good, because I want to deliver confusion here, because that's really the honest uh, description of the situation. So here you have possible values of the dark matter mass in electron volt, but I mean, don't worry about the numbers, just see the range, okay? 50 orders of magnitude, okay? And here you have some cross-section conventionally taken between the dark matter and the xenon, which is a very common material used in dark matter searches. And uh, this is, in principle, all open. Now, here I put some uh, model of uh, dark matter where of course you cannot imagine that a given model can go up as much as you want because then you get the cross section that is excluded by experiments but you see that there are candidates pretty much at all masses there are different values of the interaction cross section so the landscape of theoretical models is really broad and uh, when you face a plot like this maybe you are uh, student or a young scientist at least that say okay what, what, what do I do? how do I decide how I invest my time okay as a theorist or also as an experimentalist like uh, there are so many options what do I do and uh, a good attitude in my opinion not the only one for sure is to focus on good dark matter candidates okay good what does it mean by good good uh, by good I mean uh, candidates that are, are not just postulated ad hoc to explain the observed amount of dark matter. These are candidates that are there for other good reasons. Maybe they arise in frameworks uh, solving other issues in particle physics. So in the last 30 years, most of the activity has been focusing on uh, wings, a class of candidates. And here I put a lamp post because it's really looking for something in the dark. And, uh, uh, these uh, specific candidates were motivated by some uh, big problem in particle physics and so they had good reason to exist beyond the fact that they were providing a dark matter candidate. Of course, these are not the only option, these are not the only motivated option. If there is time in the end, I will discuss about other motivated candidates, but I want to focus on this because they are strongly motivated from theory and also because large part of the experimental searches are focusing on this type of candidates. Okay? So let's focus on this region. So first of all, let's zoom this region. So even if you cannot read, I can tell you, these are candidates in this blue spot with mass between, roughly speaking, 1 GV and 10 TV. So 1 GV is the proton mass as a reference. So it's, um, mass is more or less like the proton up to 10,000 times the, one of the, the mass of the proton. And the interaction per section is uh, more or less the one typically uh, the typical cross-section for processes mediated by weak interactions, okay? So of the order of the people bar, okay? So these theories, as I say, these candidates are motivated because they naturally arise in theories addressing the origin of the weak interaction of the Fermi scale, the so-called hierarchy problem in the standard model. They can be successfully produced in the early universe through thermal freeze-out, so we have a compelling paradigm explaining how this, the early universe was populated with these particles with the right abundance, 
which is also very important because we also want to explain after the big bang how we got with this with the amount of dark matter we observe and uh, last but not least actually this is one of the most important points this type of candidates are testable with multiple and complementary strategies okay so both for the production in the early universe as we'll, we'll discuss in a second and for the searches this diagram is really uh, a key and uh, it's very useful to visualize what happens so this is an interaction with two WIMP particles and two SM stands for standard model okay so we will see this several times during the talk but this is very important because it tells us that there are processes where you have four particles, two WIMPs and two standard models. Okay, so how do they get produced in the real universe? Well, back in the days when the universe was very young and very hot, in particular how young, when the temperature was much larger than the dark matter mass, remember the dark matter mass is proton mass up to 10,000 proton mass, so we're talking about really high temperature, the dark matter particles and uh, the primordial buff particles, quarks, leptons, all the standard model particles, were sharing a common temperature and everything was in thermal equilibrium. Okay? So this is a co-moving volume. By co-moving volume, I mean a volume that doesn't change as the universe expands. Okay? So we know now that the universe is expanding, and so all the number density gets diluted by this expansion. But I want to care about processes changing the number of particles besides the expansion. Okay, so back in the days, everything was in thermal equilibrium and the amount of dark matter and the amount of standard model particles was more or less the same. Okay, there were just numerical factors that will... Uh, so it's get variance and anti-variance at the same amount also? Or? Here? So here, uh, I think uh, this temperature you... Well, this V doesn't stand for variance, it stands for buff. Okay, but I'm just asking. I, at this point in the universe, matter and matter was equally abundant. Maybe you had one extra quark over anti quark over 10 billion, you know, the usual number. But I will not discuss biogenesis. So this is just a, a picture to, to, to say that uh, the dark matter particle and the, and the standard model were equally abundant. So it depends on the temperature that you are using. Yeah, of course, uh, biogenesis, we don't know when that happened, right? So if biogenesis happens in the weak scale, for example, at this point you have an equal amount of barium and antibarium. If you have some uh, way of producing the barium symmetry at a very high scale, then uh, maybe you have one extra barium, and then once you annihilate, you have very zero. But, uh, but I'm not going to, to discuss biogenesis. I, I just want to discuss uh, how uh, the WIMPs uh, get uh, created. Okay, now, you get to a temperature where now you start to feel the Maxwell Boltzmann suppression. Okay? So everything is still in thermal equilibrium, but when the temperature is equal to the dark matter mass, dark matter particles start to be less abundant than stuff like the electron, which is very light. Okay? So you see that there is less and less, up to the point where, typically, this is a number that can be computed, okay? I'm just telling you. When the temperature is the dark matter mass over 25, the dark matter particle is not in thermal contact with the bath anymore. So this happens, of course, in a situation where you have to imagine that the, the suppression is exponential here, okay? So this is just for illustration. But you have lots of blue particles and not many X particles. And uh, this relative amount of particle will persist until the present days, okay? So as I say, co-moving, why? Because even if the universe expands, the ratio between dark matter and the visible particles it will not change even if the universe expands. Number densities are depleted because of the expansion, ratios are preserved unless you have some uh, process that changes the number of particles. Okay? So this is just a cartoon of the production, but you can actually compute through a very rigorous calculation the amount of winds today and this is what you find. So omega x squared is just the amount of WIMPs in some units. Then I can tell you the value we measure today is 0 0.1. So if you want to reproduce the abundance of dark matter we observe today, you need an annihilation cross-section. Sigma v is just annihilation cross-section times the relative velocity of two WIMPs going to standard model of the order of the picobar, okay? which is exactly the 
typical size of weak interaction cross-section, which is precisely what you expect in these models of weeks. Okay? Now, this is a success, and this is also known as the wing miracle, this, uh, this relation here, because if you put one peak of bar, you reproduce the abundance you observe. I would like to also emphasize another aspect of this equation, which is less emphasized usually, but it's also very important. WIMPs could be a subdominant contribution to dark matter. It cannot be more than what we observe. Okay? So just the fact that this number has to be less than the total amount of dark matter gives us a lower bound on the interaction strength between the dark matter and the visible set. Okay? So this is in turn, this in turn uh, predicts a minimal rate that you should expect to see at experiments just from this consideration of relative density which is encouraging because of course if we hope to detect something we need at least a minimum amount of cross-section in order to see a signal in the experiment okay? So this argument is a very nice way to ensure that we expect to see something if this is of course the theory of transmission there are caveats, of course, but I think this is an important message. Now, as I said, uh, the field of experimental research for dark matter has been driven, driven by uh, mostly WIMPs along three main directions that I will discuss one by one, dark detection, LAC, and uh, Fermi. And as I will show, there are already impressive bounds along the three different directions, no discovery yet, otherwise we would have heard of that, but there are very impressive bounds uh, way beyond what we could expect 30 years ago. And uh, this is also a very active uh, research field in, now, in, in the present time and in the next 5-10 years we will cover a lot of the parameter space that is still not covered by the current searches. Okay? So this is something, uh, it's worth paying attention to this around these days. And. Uh, I want to make a, a quick comment uh, which, uh, of course, as I said, my talk will not be technical, but I would like to uh, discuss uh, one aspect of these WIMP searches, which is something I work on. So the three different uh, strategies, uh, a collider, gamma ray telescopes, and nuclear records, we will discuss these three in details. But they are a probe of dark matter couplings at different energy scales, okay? Because the typical energy involved in the process is different for each process that we are considering. For example, if we look for dark matter at collider, the relevant energy scale is the center of mass energy of the protons that collide to each other at the LAC. If we look for dark matter in direct detection, I will describe what it is, but the recoil energy is really, really small, so there is a very small energy transfer between the two particles. So these are these searches are probe of oops. These searches are probe of dark matter couplings at very different energy scales, which are different by orders of magnitude. And we know that uh, physics is scale dependent. The most, uh, probably the most famous case is the one of strong interactions that uh, we know that once we probe nature at higher energy scales or equivalently to smallness length scales, we know that the coupling constant gets smaller and uh, we recover perturbation theory and QCD is perturbative. This is described by a simple, simple looking uh, equation which uh, describes the evolution of the coupling with the energy. It was not simple at all to get to this result and it took uh, three very clever people. But now these are well-known uh, effects in quantum field theory and we know that couplings are energy dependent. And so it's worth remembering that once we compare different searches for WIMPs, uh, we are actually comparing bounds on couplings of the WIMPs at different energy scales and the connection between these energy scales can be very important once we try to compare uh, the different exclusion bounds if we want to compare apples to apples okay? and so we will see few, I will sketch a few examples because this is something I've been working in the last few years okay? but uh, let's go and discuss these three, uh, these three different strategies I would like to start with direct detection. It's my favorite one uh, because there is a very nice analogy and uh, I think I can explain this even to somebody who doesn't know much physics. So uh, this is the analogy I want to use. Okay, so I'm sure everybody has played pool at least once in, the, in, the, in their life. So I, I am a very good player, at least I think I am. So if I want to put the red 
ball in this here, in the corner, in the hole. What do I do? Well, I hit the cue ball, I hit it very well, I hit the red with the white, and then this goes here. Very simple. Okay? So, dark matter direct detection is playing pools with one invisible ball. Okay? So, now, the analogy is the following. The dark matter particle is the equivalent of the white ball once we play pool. There are two important differences. The first one is that it's invisible. The second one is that being invisible, we do not have the power. We can be as good as we want as players, but we cannot direct the dark matter. So, this comes from the galaxy. We know that dark matter particles are around. Remember Vera Rubin, the dark matter halo, in this room, there are lots of dark matter particles. We'll see the number in the next slide. But lots of dark matter particles hitting our face, entering through the window, not through the door, through the wall, going out. Lots of dark matter particles. So we have dark matter particles hitting the Earth. And in particular, we can think about playing pool with this particle. Well, the analogy here is that instead of a red ball, we have target nuclei. And this usually happens in the shielded labs, like uh, I have in mind the one at Ransasso, but there are many others in the world. Shielded why? Because we also want to get rid of the background from cosmic rays. There are also lots of cosmic rays hitting the Earth. If we go deep underground, the cosmic rays will not penetrate too much the mountains, but these are where the particles are so weakly coupled that it will make it to the lab. Okay? And once this particle hit the target nucle nucleus, the equivalent of the red ball, then we see a collision precisely identical to the one in the pool table with the difference that the experimental colleagues sitting in the lab they see this uh, red ball at rest and then they see it moving without any apparent reason okay? so since things do not start moving for no reasons we conclude that it was hitting by something and this something is the dark matter okay? okay, so let's look at the numbers we know the local dark matter density, the energy density. So for a WIMP, a typical mass of 100 GV, so let's look at the number. So at this very moment, in my face, for each, uh, sorry, for each centimeter square of my face, for each second, there are 10 to the 5 dark matter particles hitting my head. Okay? If this is the theory, if this is a WIMP. So this number seems big. Of course, it's not very big because the flux is really high, but the cross-sections are really small, and the rate is the combination of the two. Okay? So, just to give you a number with some example we know very well, the flux of neutrinos coming from the sun is 10 to the 10, I think, in these units, more or less. It's 10 billions. Okay? And it took us a long time to detect these neutrinos. So this is a very, very difficult business. But of course, this flux is not zero. If it's not zero, there is a non-zero probability of detecting these events. And uh, this is, again, a sketch of what I was discussing before. So you have a wind hitting a nuclear target, and you want to detect the recoil energy of this target here. These are really small recoil energies. So it's a very tough business from the experimental point of view, because you have to detect very, very tiny deposition of energy. Okay. Now, here is go back to, to you. Sorry, just to, uh, what, what is the main of the nuclear target? How does it avoid getting hit by neutrinos? Oh, the neutrino, they will hit that, but uh, it's my next plot. It's my next plot. The neutrino background, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah so I, I will get to that. Of course, uh, you can do shielding all the time, but neutrinos will make it their way to the detector, and that's something that people are paying a lot of attention to. Uh, going back to your comments. So there are several possible mediators for this interaction. It's an elastic interaction between the dark matter and the nuclei, nucleus. The Z boson, the X bosons, these are all possible mediators. You see, these are the typical numbers. And uh, now, this is a very important plot. It's the exclusion given by the experiment. And uh, on the horizontal axis, there is the mass. You see, from 1 GB to 1,000 GB. This is the wind region, okay? more or less, roughly speaking. And this is the cross-section on the vertical axis. And this is the experimental bound. What is the bound? So the best bound is the xenon monotone line here. So everything above this line is excluded. Above. If you have found nothing, then it means that the cross-section has to be smaller than some given value. Okay? 
So this uh, orange region is the so-called neutrino floor. Okay? So at some point, your limit will get so good that you will start seeing neutrinos, exactly what you were saying before. And the event is something you cannot distinguish from a dark matter event. So this is an intrinsic limitation of this type of experiments. And, uh, but, but, but we know the amount of neutrino hitting the, hitting the Earth very well. We know the flux, we know the cross-section, this is weak interaction, so we can compute when this will be reached. And you see, we are still a few, we, few orders of magnitude far away, but this will happen in the next 10 years. So the projection is that in the next 10 years we will be able to, to see neutrinos if we don't see anything in between. Okay? Irreducible, it's indistinguishable from what a wind would give you. And so th that's why it's an intrinsic limitation and people are starting to think about uh, ways to go below this uh, floor, for example, starting to use directional information because you know, the, the dark matter neutrinos, they have different, the, the fluxes, but this is really in the future. For now, in the next uh, 10 years, more or less, we will get here and if WIMPs are not here, we will see neutrinos. Yes. What's the difference between uh, neutrino detection experiments and dark matter detection experiments? What do you mean by neutrino? There are many. You mean from the sun? Yeah. Um, I would say that. Uh, yeah, the ground Well, I mean, in that case, you are uh, searching for something that, which is very, um, you already know it's there. So you know the cross-section of the kinematics. And... Uh, well, in the case of neutrinos, you're trying to divert the neutrino into an electron. You know that... Oh, you mean the, char the charge car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For electrons, right? The dark matter cannot produce anything, and then you're looking for the recoil of yeah, but also, you, we also see neutral currents in the neutrinos, right? So we also saw that yeah, but in 1988. So yeah, that's in neutral laboratory experiments. Yeah, 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 exactly. But uh, in the case, you, most of the neutrino experiments are not looking for nuclear recoil. You don't have precision to see. So no, exactly. So nuclear recoil, right? Are okay. better you're looking for that. Yeah, there's some nuclear reaction. I mean, historically, the way we discovered neutrino was through charge currents. So the neutrino was hitting, as you said, it was hitting the, the detector. W exchange, so you saw an electron and a muon coming out of this. Uh, so that's an important difference. Maybe one could rephrase the question just saying that matter could be a background for neutrino experiments. Uh, I think the. The, the rate is too small to be a background for neutrino searches, I, I believe. But what do you mean? I mean, so for, if you are looking for neutrinos through charge currents, dark matter is not the problem. Okay. Now, if you're looking through neutral currents, uh, which, I, but, but I, uh, now I don't remember, but I mean, the, the experiment in Canada, which was the confirmation of oscillations. But I think this was the key of this. It was with uh, heavy water. Yeah. They were looking but for. Uh, but I'm sure it's not recoil, right? It's not. Electric. It's not. If the kinematics is different, yeah. the, sig the experimental signal is definitely different. Yeah. And uh, it's elastic scattering. Right? Exactly. For yes. So it, this is a different uh, type of kinematics. So this is completely elastic event. So that's why it's so challenging because you only see this nuclear and the numbers are really. And these are really small numbers to detect. Uh, KB. So, what comes in, in the calculation of the neutrino floor is actually, when we read this, like an energy in me, right? It's not the, it's the neutrino energy problem. So exactly. it, it, does the energy. Mean, it doesn't mean that the neutrino mass is 100 GB, of no, course. It's the energy of the neutrino. Yeah, it so means that. Uh, so, it's folded the, uh, the flux. It, it's very different because, you know, these uh, WIMPs are no relativistic particles moving very slow compared to the speed of light. Neutrinos are all very relativistic. So I understand this plot as the rate 
of a neutrino will be the same as a WIMP with 100 GV and 10 to the minus 49. Right, so considering all the uh, possible spec, no, all the energies of the neutrinos. All of them, I mean, you, you sum all of them. Probably this increase of the, of the neutrino floor is due to a higher floods of neutrinos of energies of around 10 GV. Yes, because that's uh, really, yeah. So as you go to lower mass, of course, uh, you expect uh, more events because neutrinos, I mean, you know that the, the, it's a broad spectrum no, of the neutrinos coming from all different sources. I think it's what Rogero just said, what Rogero just said, is that you, you have uh, more neutrinos at that energy. So you have uh, more events and then you expect to see them sooner at this, uh, at this rate. This 1000 GV is kind of weird, I don't know, I don't know where that comes from. Well, but you also see that the bound gets smaller, no? With the, so it's weaker and weaker, which... Okay. Uh, just, just a quick uh, notice. This is something I, I work on. Uh, the result from three years ago. For a specific WIMP model with a given mass and a given mediator mass, if you analyze the data and then you impose the bounds with or without accounting for this scale separation, so here RG is a normalization group evolution. You see that the, so let's look at the blue line, for example. This is the actual bound you get, and this is the bound you would get without accounting for this. So it's uh, orders of magnitude wrong result if you forget about this scale separation. And uh, if you want to know more about this, I'm very happy to. I just want to emphasize the importance of keeping into account the fact that you have to put the coupling at the right energy scale because couplings evolve with the scale. Do you know what what? What happens if we copy this? What happens if we copy this? What do you do out of this? Ah, micromega. Um, I mean, this would be the tolerable. I don't know if, I mean, now we've been uh, talking to, for example, uh, uh, some uh, direct detection collaborations are in including this. Uh, I don't know if Micromega is, uh, is including this. I don't think so. I mean, this is you know, this is a case, of course, we pick a model. So this is a Z prime where the dark matter has a vector current, the quarks have an axial current. The effect was particularly large in this model. In other models, it's more like uh, uh, an effect of order one. So it's not. Uh, always uh, so large, but in principle has to be included everywhere. I mean, it's a theory thing, it's not the experimental part of the right? Of course, of course. So it's, uh, models, so it's, a theory. it's only a theory question, and uh, once you compute a rate, you know, WIMPs are defined at the mass of the mediator and the mass of, so mediator and their mother particles are more or less at the weak scale. Once you compute the dark detection rate, you have to take this theory and evolve this theory down. It's like computing the mu on decay with the Fermi Lagrangian. Okay? So you integrate out the W, and then from the weak scale down to the mu on mass, you have to do the RG. Okay? And these corrections are not optional. Okay? They have to be included. Sorry. Is there an easy way to understand why the bounds are weaker by including the There is a very easy way. So you see, imagine you integrate out the z prime. So here you have a gamma mu and a gamma mu gamma phi. What happens is that through RG, you induce a mixing, a mixing from axial current to vector current. And the operator you generate through the mixing is an operator which is spin independent, as opposed to this one, which is spin dependent and velocity suppressed. So the message is that it is worth paying the price of a loop but you generate an operator which has a huge, uh, because of this coherent enhancement, of, so it's all nuclear physics, okay? So the operator you generate for mixing is a loop suppressed operator. But then you have this nuclear effect that uh, enhances the rate. Same question, okay, very good. Okay, oh wow. So, collider. Collider is uh, another way to read this diagram where you collide the few other particles let's say protons, LAC. And then uh, you see that you produce two wind particles. Of course, uh, 
This is a better description of the process. This is the collision at the LHC looped in the transverse plane. If all you do is to produce q dark matter particles, you see nothing in the event. That's not a very good signal. So you also need something to trigger on, such as initial state radiation. And basically, the way the dark matter manifests uh, manifest itself, a collider is through an apparent violation of energy and momentum. There is an energy momentum imbalance in the transverse plane. Why? Because these dark matter particles are invisible, so they pass the detector, and you don't detect the energy and the momentum that they carry with them. Okay? So here is again a plot that uh, was produced by the Atlas collaboration. Again, for this model with an axial vector mediator, where you have the mass of the mediator here, the mass of the dark matter here, this is the exclusion line. We found that the scale separation effects are really mild once you apply these to monojet effects, monojet searches, sorry, searches with one jet in the final state. Now, the problem is that the LSC collaborations, they like, not only the LSC collaborations, but they like this plot very much when you put on the direct detection plot, so this is sigma direct detection, wind mass, you put collider and direct detection together. Now, if you want to do this comparison, you have to do that properly, and you want to make sure you compare apple to apple. This is the direct detection plot. You have dark matter mass and direct, detec direct detection cross-section. So this is a plot with couplings defined at the nuclear physics scale, at the very low scale where you have direct detection. So, of course, there is no issue with this bound reported by the direct detection collaborations. There is a potential issue with this LSC bound, because the LSC bound is a bound of dark matter coupling at the, at the collider scale. And you have to translate that down to the direct detection scale. So we did the RG to do this. And we found that, so the dash line is without the running, the solid line is with the running. There is a factor of two different. So it's an order one effect. Okay, so it's not as huge as in the previous case, but uh, we also found these effects uh, similar size in the monophoton searches. So these uh, scale separation effects are also important once we compare collider and direct detection. So this is a I think so uh, no, this is another one because the Atlas collaboration didn't provide that, uh, uh, that uh, model. So this is axial axial on both sides. So it's it's uh, this is not a, it's a different it's a different model. So what is V and V? Here, V is the mass of the mediator, so it's a spin one, so they call it V vector particle, and the chi is the dark matter particle, and the couplings are fixed to this number. So this is a benchmark for the collaboration that they're using. To Okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm yeah. Confused. So you have one particular coupling, so your limit is from monogen surges, which is the limit of the cross section. And then how can you spend this large region in the cross section? This one? Yeah, the whole, I mean, the whole green stuff is excluded. Yes. So oh, um, it's just a translation of this bound here. This is the, this is the collider bound, okay? Now, in this model, you fix the coupling of dark matter and the coupling of quarks to the mediator. So if you have a bound on the mediator mass, you can translate that into a bound on the cross-section, because the cross-section depends on the, you exchange, it's a propagator of this mediator. So it's so one over mv to the fourth. So you vary the mediator. You vary the mediator mass, and that's why you, you find that you get two solutions for each dark matter mass, because there are two solutions here. That's, you just the confusing maybe the confusing is that the dark matter mass here is on the vertical axis and here is on the horizontal axis. But it's the same. It's the same thing, but it's important to connect mm -hmm. the, the, the scales. Okay. Last, in the detections. So here we point our telescopes toward regions of high dark matter density, such as the Milky Way Center or even the dwarf galaxies. And what we do, we look for annihilations of dark matter particles, or it would be more appropriate to say that we look for the annihilation products of these uh, processes in the, in the, in the galactic uh, center, for example. And we have uh, fantastic instruments like the Fermi gamma ray telescopes that detect, in this case, photons, but you can detect uh, positrons, antiprotons, neutrinos, all sorts of stable standard model particles. Okay? So here, what the collaboration uh, produced 
uh, are plots like this where you have on the horizontal axis again the dark matter mass and on the vertical axis the annihilation cross-section now when you talk about annihilation cross-section there is a very interesting number which is this number here this is in natural units the famous pico bar I was talking about before okay so this is the number you need to get the relative density so it's a very useful benchmark for the cross-section and you see that for this specific model where the dark matter annihilates to tau plus tau minus this is the experimental bound, the solid line and uh, the cross-section has to be below this line so here you have the thermal relics below 100 GB are excluded by the model, by, by these bounds if the main annihilation channel is to tau plus tau minus the tau is the heavier brother of the electron okay, so last thing uh, also about the effects uh, here we studied uh, models where the dark matter was only coupled to leptons so you can conclude, and you would be wrong that if you have no coupling to nuclei because you couple to electrons you have no signal in our detection you have no coupling to protons so you don't produce these small particles at the LAC because you're only talking to the electrons to the electrons in general, we studied the general case of leptons so the only promising way to search for this type of models is if the dark matter annihilate to leptons, so to indirect detection. Okay, this seems only it seems only really the only way. So are we sure? The answer is of course not, and that's what we studied uh, a couple of years ago. And we found that uh, even if the dark matter couples to leptons, it couples to leptons only at some energy scale. Okay, you it's you can impose artificially the couples to leptons only but that's a statement that you can make consistently only at the given energy scale so you can hide this dark matter at most from one search okay? but since we have different search strategies probing different energy scales this, they will be mixing with the quarks and then we found that actually in some models the best bounds were coming from hadronic processes okay? it's again thanks to this mixing of operators from leptons to quarks this for indirect detection is, uh, is, uh, is uh, of course uh, a serious issue because we don't know the profile very well and there are people trying to quantify this, uh, this, uh, this, this issue this is true both for the galactic center but even if you look at dwarf galaxies which are small galaxies around the Milky Way because we don't know the so-called J-factor you know, this uh, integral over the density we don't know that very precisely and uh, there is an uncertainty which is uh, a factor of a few okay, so that's, that's also an important uh, a very important uh, problem with the searches which uh, is there no, no because it's all uh, standard model running so all we are assuming is that you integrate out the mediator you have an effective theory with standard model plus dark matter and the running from the mediator scale down to the nuclear scale we are just assuming the existence of the standard model which is a good assumption so it's, uh, it's not optional and there is nothing you can do to maybe you can add more fields to delete but you will be afraid there are no symmetry reasons to to, the, to, to prevent this mixing. Can you invent some What? Can you invent No, I mean, if, if I'm assuming that the field, the field theory is a standard model plus dark matter below the major mass, uh, uh, the symmetries are not something I can invent. They're, they are there. So I just do a self consistent field theory calculation of the, of the, of the running of the operator. Okay, so this concludes the overview of wind searches. How are we doing with time? How much longer do you need? No, no, I can, I can uh, conclude uh, in five minutes. Yeah, so just to give you some perspective, okay? Because I said WIMPs uh, the last 30 years, people have been talking about WIMPs, I work on WIMPs, uh, many people work on WIMPs, but let's keep in mind that there are not only WIMPs, okay? So I would like to say two things. This is goes back to your comment, in the next 10 years these are the projection of all the future experiments there is this experiment called Darwin which plans to reach the neutrino floor 
And within the next few years, so here is really, 10 years is not a huge time scale, okay? On this, on, 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 on the, when it's about fundamental field, 10 years is something that you can see with some optimism. You will see the end of this program, okay? So we will get here. So there are two clear options. One is that the WIMPs will be discovered, and then who knows, maybe this will be just the beginning of the discovery, it's also a collider and uh, indirect detection, or maybe no WIMPs. And uh, I think it's already time to, to think about other options. So I would like to briefly mention, mention in uh, three minutes, another option called the action, which is not new at all, but it's uh, another type of uh, candidate, that a candidate that is strongly motivated from particle physics. It's motivated by the strong CP problem because we know that strong interactions respect the symmetry of reversing the error of time very, very accurately. We do not measure the neutron electric dipole moment. And so once we try to account this with the theory, we have to impose a severe cancellation about different, two different uh, dimensionless numbers, as severe as one part in 10 billions. So a very elegant solution was by Pechai and Quinn in the late 70s. This solution predicts a new particle, which is very light and extremely weakly coupled. And uh, besides the theoretical motivation, I think it's really, really interesting to uh, think about axons now, because as you can find in this review here, in the last five, I would say less than 10 years, between five and 10 years, there has been an explosion of new ideas, a new proposal to detect axions. Axion detection is even more uh, difficult than WIMPs because it's very weakly coupled, okay? It's a pseudo number, number called some boson with a symmetry which is broken at a very high scale. So the couplings are really, really small. It's a very tough business. And uh, it's an appealing dark matter candidate because uh, it's uh, motivated and uh, it's something that is going to be explored very soon and very, very broadly, okay? The dark matter can be made of axons. Another interesting manifestation of axons is as an additional contribution to dark radiation. So this is something I'm working on right now. And uh, basically, you can have production of uh, axions from collisions of thermal bud particles. This is not the axion field, okay? the oscillating field given dark matter. These are just the fundamental particles okay, of the axion field, which are start produced from binary collisions of uh, particles in the universe. And they, they would manifest themselves as additional neutrinos. Okay. So they're being thermal equilibrium. They could be in thermal equilibrium, they may not be in thermal equilibrium. Okay? As, lo as, as long as you produce them, they are there and they are not relativistic. But uh, is the process uh, that way also happening? It depends uh, on the couplings. We are studying both cases. Okay? So, if, of course, if you start to make lots of them, eventually you also have the reaction uh, going in the other way. But it doesn't have to be. But the important point is that if you collide V1 and V2 and you produce A, A will be there. Even if it doesn't thermalize, you don't have to forget that you produce some A. And the way you will look for it is uh, to looking at the number of neutrinos around CMB, and they are indistinguishable from neutrinos. So you will see something like more than three neutrinos, in effect. So hot dark matter is excluded, no? This is not dark matter. This is dark radiation. So this axon field will not be, the axon parts will not be dark matter. The axon, you, uh, you, you would have both a hot and cold component. Ah. The cold component will give you dark matter, and the hot component will give you, so it's a complementary probe of axon physics. It's subdominant probe. Very subdominant, yes, like neutrinos are subdominant. Exactly, very, very subdominant. So we are producing plots like this, where we predict uh, the expected delta and effective as a function of the couplings. What I want to say about this work in progress with the micro laborators, this is a result, is that the effect is visible by future CMB surveys. Okay, so this is the two sigma band. And also that there are complementary probes such as the so-called helioscopes, axons produced from the sun, which can test the same region of outer space. So all I want to deliver with these plots is that there is axon that matter, but the axion theory can be tested not only with dark matter, but by also other different ways. 
In particular, about this H0 tension, uh, there are two different measurements of the Hubble uh, parameter, the one in the early universe and the one in the late universe. They are more or less four sigma away, and we found that you could alleviate this tension by assuming the, pres the presence of additional axons in the, at the time of CMB formation. So that's something we did uh, last year. And uh, I'm happy to give more details uh, offline. For now, let me conclude by just reminding you that in more than 2,000 years, we were only able to figure out 5% of the composition of the universe. We have a beautiful theory describing its content, but it's only 5%. The landscape of uh, the Arpader theories, which was the main focus of my talk, is really broad, as you see from this plot. And uh, I've been talking mostly about WIMPs because they are motivated, because they were the uh, effort of uh, 30 years of experimental searches, and uh, because also we have a rich program in the next uh, 10 years, but let's not forget that there is all of this plane. And uh, especially in the last few years, people have been focusing more on exotic possibilities and also on candidates that are not motivated, but they're just there to account for their matter. Why not? We have no reason to believe that the dark matter must also solve some other problem. It should just be an additional particle. So it's really a time where it's good to be open-minded. So we have a lot of questions that are without an answer, but this is exciting because it means that there is a lot of work for all of us. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, when you say we understand 5% of the universe, maybe okay, maybe we should say we know because they gotta <laughs> you're absolutely right. Genesis and all that. We know we know but we do not understand. Okay, if you think about the biogenesis, the strong CP problem, the hierarchy problem, these are all things that you can maybe solve with initial conditions, but of course it's not satisfactory and it's not something we Understand, I, I agree, it's not the proper word. So we, we know the composition of 5% of the universe, but even within this 5%, there is a lot to, 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 to figure out, of course. So, how does it happen? Yes, yes. And this is projected sensitivity uh, for the whole lifetime? Lifetime? What do you mean by lifetime? Experiment? 10 years, that's the time scale. Now, it's always difficult to give a precise uh, estimate, you never know, but the time scale is of the order of 10 years. So, the Earth is also zero? Yes. So, the problem is if I get the wind finding that. So, dark matter is observed gravitation. Yes. And these experiments seem to be very different from the experiments you're talking about here. So, is there any way of combining the two kinds of experiments and getting information? What do you mean? Is so the evidence for dark matter comes is only gravitation. Only gravitation. So only gravitation. Yeah, but it comes from experiments, right? Obs yeah, observations of visible objects. Yes. Right. So are any of these observations, can any of these observations be used to get information about what kind of dark matter it is? It sounds like just like two completely different areas. But how dark matter is excluded, right? Just from structure formation. Okay. So that's, that's Yes. Cool. yes. But is there any others? Uh, yeah, but that's no. I see. I see what. So I think uh, in if we want to detect dark matter in some labs on Earth, gravitational interactions are way too small to give any signal. I understand, but my worry is getting zero is seems to be a zero. So the only positive results come from other experiments. We've only got negative results from experiments. Well, we got uh, ex uh, negative uh, searches, I mean, exclusion bounds, yes. Uh, I, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, but, uh, you know, every time you try to write down a concrete model, it's very hard to avoid uh, interactions between, uh, beyond the rotational ones. And also, you also have to explain how, from the Big Bang, the universe got populated with dark matter. In the absence of other interactions, I, I mean, there, there are cases where it's only to gravity, but in general, it's, you can always find a case where you will never see anything. I can write down hundreds of theories where you will never see anything, but 
let's be optimistic and. Uh, yeah, the worst case scenario is exactly what said. Only direct adaptation. Yes. But even so, can't you figure out how you direct the stars? Maybe you're not thinking that. Gravitation. No, stars are made of baryons and things like that. But if it interacts with baryons, but but that's not a gravitational interaction anymore. Yeah, I'm just saying that maybe from astronomy, it might sound like that kind of Right, so this dark matter can be captured in the sun, but it's also, that's also gravitational stuff. Well, the capture is not gravitational. The capture is not gravitational. No gravitation. It's uh, the spin, in spin dependent uh, elastic uh, scatter. So that's right? from that. There are bounds, but that's not gravity. That's, that's, that's not gravity. That's not gravity. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's not gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's. Uh, yeah, and then you look for indirect symptoms yeah. from yeah. annihilation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that, that was in. Uh, so maybe we can go back to. A lot. Here, yes. So the yeah, the lensing is one of them. So all of these are, as you say, they are only a confirmation that the dark matter talks to us via gravity. Yes. But uh, I mean, if we want to learn more about the mass, about the, the properties, I, I feel these are not very. The gravitational landscape is uh, a property which is more difficult not to just to deal with uh, some extension. Oh, absolutely, yes. But even even things like uh, this famous, the bullet, the bullet cluster is also uh, Even if you think about structure formation in the real universe, if you don't, if you do not add anything on top of baryons, it's really difficult to get for the structure to go non linear. So there are many reasons to believe that it cannot just be a modification of gravity. A question about the you, you said that the amount that goes through all phases and everywhere here is a quantity that we estimate, and uh, I want to know how do you, do you ex estimate that? Is do how much dark matter is here? Yeah, do you make a, a assumption that this is even in space? Or no, 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 okay, good, good, very good question, very good question. So, there are two ways to estimate the local amount of dark matter density. One is to study the motion of stars around the solar system in the vertical galactic plane. And uh, if you see how the star moves, you can reconstruct the gravitational potential just by using classical mechanics, gravity. And by the, uh, by the gravitational potential, you can reconstruct the dark matter density, the, the, the density, because it's, uh, it's what puts these stars in motion. So that's a direct measurement of the local dark matter density. There is also another way which is doing what Vera Rubin did uh, for the other galaxies for our galaxy. So trying to build a rotation core for our galaxy which has been done recently. And um, that's uh, a way to produce uh, a plot like this. No, where was that? Here. If you produce a plot like this for our galaxy, now here is really the distance from the galactic center and here is the velocity. Knowing the velocity is equivalent to knowing the dark matter density because that's the reason why the star is moving. So all you have to do is to put yourself in this plot at a distance equal to the one of the solar system, which is 7.5 kiloparsec, and then you read the velocity and then you, and so these are two ways and they give more or less the same number. <coughs> The difference between, sorry. Because if it, it interacts with gravity, doesn't it change from being on Earth or outside Earth? Like oh, these are small effects. No, you, you can assume that in the solar system the density is, is uniform. Sorry, when you say uniform, you meant the solar system? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that is uniform. I thought you meant uh, across the galaxy. Of course, across the galaxy is not uniform. But if you focus on a small region, small compared to the galactic size as a solar system is uniform. But the, the way I just described are the ways that we know the number, but it is uniform, sorry. Yes, 
should not should should uh, made from the made from the early universe and part of the universe. Can you repeat your question please? Is there is some modern debate argument that tells you that the matter should interact with the model? So, I mean, uh, what, what I can say is that there are models where the dark matter has to interact with the standard model. WIMPs. WIMPs are one example. If you have a WIMP, you cannot avoid. The fact that there exist models with this property, it doesn't mean that the models are true. Yeah, but okay. Maybe from, from the earlier there is some argument that it should interact. No, there is. Unfortunately, it's not possible to, to, to come up with this, uh, this argument. Well, only if you want to explain the abundance of these particles today, then it's what the physicists said. If it's a wind, but there are also ways uh, with, without interaction with the standard model to give the same abundance. So that's. Continuing with the question Is there then a mechanism to wait, assuming that our method doesn't couple to standard model? Are there mechanisms to explain why dark matter would form at only based on gravity around galaxies? Because it cannot be uniform in the whole universe, right? It cannot. So, well, there are two things. Uh, the first one is how you populate the early universe in a smooth way uh -huh. with that given amount of dark matter, mm -hmm. and then how you form structures. The way you form structure is not a problem because we know that there is inflation giving fluctuation and this fluctuation evolved in a way that we understand very well and you have gravitational collapse of over densities. So that's fine. The only problem is to get basically this number, this 25% today, which is a statement about the whole universe. What is the average dark matter density in the entire universe? Not in our, our galaxy has a lot of dark matter compared to the average. Okay? This number is something that is difficult to get in the early universe. Forming galaxies is fine. Once you give me a way to produce this 25%, if you also give me inflation to give you this, uh, I don't know if you know about inflation, but it's uh, just a mechanism to produce uh, fluctuation. So you have some regions of the universe where you have some more dark matter, some regions where you have less. And uh, just the gravitational collapse, you have galaxies forming in the early universe. Uh, I, I don't know what works, but I mean, if, even if I have a uh, dark matter which is only detecting gra gravitation and even standard model, I would have a stable dark matter ball distribution around the galaxy, which is stable, it doesn't collapse, so it would have a. Yeah, but that's. That that's, works about, uh, that's what. Uh, I mean, you mean a halo of dark matter? So that's. Uh, that's how it is. That's the way it is, right? So it's there are simulations that uh, make sure that. Exactly. Okay. Only gravitational and structure is very Exactly. So only gravitational for the structure is fine. It's actually the main player for structure formation is only about gravity. You, well, you, on most scales you can have something else. Let's say it's just gravity, okay, as far as we know. But producing the right amount in the early universe is what is tricky. But you can do that also with only gravity. There are ways. There are, big, there are models. That's true for the 5% too. The 5%? Uh, it's not like Genesis, also don't know exactly. Yeah, no, yeah, of course, of course. You, 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 you need to, that's a number that we know, but we don't know how to explain, as my other was saying. We don't know how to explain this number. We don't understand the origin of this, uh, this barrier this symbol. So there are many things we don't understand, so that's good for you guys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the students have lots of things to try to understand. So that's it for just again. Thank you. There should be new questions. Uh,